Whew. Welcome back to the sharpening bench. Um, today, I'm making a long overdue video about finding sharpening stones in the wild. I get this question a lot, like how do you evaluate them and figure out you know, what in God's name you're holding and is it any good? Did you hit a home run or is it common as dirt? Um, it takes a long time to develop the eye, um, to get a feel for them. And every day I get fooled by stones, very common. So there's a lot of pitfalls and things to look for, to avoid. So without further ado, let's just jump into it. Um, the worst thing about looking at stones in the wild is that they're often covered in dirt, dust, oil, grease, and that could obscure a lot of the inherent qualities of what the stone is or could be. So um, the first thing I'm gonna do is pick up a stone and just size it up by heft and by weight. And literally anyone can do this. It's not a special skill. You can look at the size of the stone. You're gonna like give it a little, you know, and you're gonna say, does this feel heavier than usual or lighter than usual? First clue can mean a lot of different things, but if it's lighter than usual, it's probably a little more common, maybe even possibly synthetic. If it's really light, it could be interesting, but also probably synthetic. If it feels dense or heavier than average, um, it could be a quality stone. What? It's kind of like um, one of those flow charts. If you ever seen a mechanic and you got a problem, they go to A and they say, is it yeah, yeah? And you go here, here. And you branch off until you get to the bottom of it. That's a lot like finding stones in the wild. Um, you're gonna evaluate if it's covered in grease or not. Um, the stone probably has some grease on it. Um, the stone definitely has a little grease. Um, you can look at other things like, does it have a box? Is the box nice? Does it have a label? Um, labels are always good. The stones you want to avoid like the plague are gonna be the um, carborundum. They're the synthetic ones that the carborundum company made around the turn of the century. And they're still to this day cheap, cheap, cheap. And carborundum stones or combination stones usually, um, they will look like this. They're gray. They're kind of a nondescript color. They'll feel heavy, but they're cheap. You should never pay more than a couple bucks for one in any sale. You'll see combination stones, fine silicone carbide, coarse silicone carbide. Um, this is a combination India stone. India stones are synthetic. India stones are, in my opinion, a little bit better and serviceable and a little more valuable than silicone carbide, but not my much. They're still very cheap stones, still being made. You can get them brand new for not a lot of money. So there's that. So you usually find these stones and you're looking at them and you can usually get the stones cheap when you find them at a yard sale. You know, at a flea market, at an antique store. Um, but you gotta do the work. Especially if they're greased stones. You know, you gotta degrease them, clean them up, see how they work. Another point really worth mentioning is that you can have a coarse stone, like a silicone carbide synthetic, and when you use it and you're sharpening it, the stone's gonna break in and it's very deceptive just by the touch of the stone. Um, sometimes stones can feel so smooth but when you clean them lap them up they're actually you know might be something totally different than what you expected so how do you lap stones how do you degree stones um, it's a good question before we get to that I want to cover another key indicator because you're going to use all your six senses maybe even your 12 senses to evaluate stones one of them very direct visual colors um, most of the colors you're going to see in stones are going to range from like a white to a sandier color, to your uh, grayish blue, your blue blacks, and then you'll see um, sandier maroon colored stones. And um, if you ever see stones that have any inherent green or purple, that's a dead buy, right on the spot. Um, purple and green are usually associated with um, 
kind of unique stones that are always nice. So if you ever see a color that's kind of out of the spectrum, um, that's always a good indicator. It's always a buy in my book. Always, always. Um, another thing you can look for is, and this is a feature of natural stones, to have a little bit of a sparkle. Um, certain kinds of slates, micaceous like slates, have a little bit of a sparkle. For example, this is a real OG stone. Um, it's from Indian Pond, New Hampshire. It could be from the 1820s to the 1920s, but it might be tough to pick up on camera. But this has a wonderful sparkle. So if you see like a fine sparkle color, that's always an interesting sign too. So color is a big indicator. So these are some stones. Um, everything right here just came to me in the mail today. So I finally have some stones that need a little work. Um, so we can show this process, what they look like when you find them. And it's a quick way to clean them up. So we're gonna flip the camera around to my lapping station where a lot of the hard work and magic happens. You shouldn't have to spend a lot of time cleaning up the stone. I grab these five. Got a granite plate, boot tray to catch the slop and runoff, bucket of water to dip. Um, this is loose silicone carbide powder. It's really cheap. Buy it by the pound online. Sandpaper is fine. Um, we'll get to degreasing later, real soon. For now, I'm just going to grab, this is water. And for example, this is an old India stone. If you have a pencil, you make some scratch marks. We're in the field. And we're scratching start to see a little bit of the two red of the indie stone come out. So you can do this with what you have on hand. But if you really want to go fast and pro, um, you don't need a granite plate. You can use float glass. You can use um, ceramic tiles. They will wear in, but that's okay if you have good pattern work. This is the coarsest I have for powder at 60 grit. So for example, let's take this one. It's got, right off the bat, through the grease and the stain, um, it feels really fine, it's dense, I don't see pores or porosity. <coughs> but what it is, is an old washita, and one of my favorite kinds with the color grade structure. It's one of the more common, and they're old. They're most certainly old. And that's all you do. And what you'll see is, more of the true color of the stone. Um, if I degrease this, it probably would get whiter, but that's about what these things do. Um, metal, swarf, paste, all that. Sandy, lovely washita color. Haven't measured for um, gravity yet which we're gonna to get to, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we've covered, you know, how to just judge the wild quickly. Colors, lap work, um, the oil stones are always gonna be a little more trick. Um, the scratch test, this is a good one in the wild. And this is not going to in any way indicate whether the stone is um, coarse or fine or medium. It's just a scratch test, but it will help you kind of um, hone in on what you're working with. For example, I know this one. It's a known stone to me. It just came today, but um, this should scratch almost like a fine powder. But it's hard. So it's scratchable. Now compared to this washita, which is Novaculite, it skips over the edge more. Um, so again, um, we will not tell you the quality of the stone, how good or bad the stone is with the scratch test, but it will point you in the direction of what the stone 
geologically or synthetically is. This is another Washita. It's just a, a lighter, sandier color, and this will have about the same scratch ability as this one. Really skipping. This is a Translucent Arkansas. These are almost always unmistakable. And they're also cool because what? Well, they're translucent, you know, they catch light. But listen to the sound. So the scratch test is a good one. Cover the colors. Um, you know, the most common ones are gonna be these gray to blues. Um, I have a thing for lighter colored stones because when you're working them, Swarf, sorry, slurry is what comes up in the stone. It's when the particles fry off. That's slurry. Swarf is the metal that's coming off. And the lighter colored stones, you get a visual feedback of how quickly you're moving material, removing it from your metal edge. So I like that visual feedback, especially as you're learning. Um, so you want to stay away from the synthetic um, silicone carbide, carborundum type stones. You don't want to spend money on them. Um, but a lot of slate colored stones, like here are some slates over here, can look like them. They have the same dull gray color spectrum. But these are in a league of their own. These are all special stones over here on the left. Every one of them is... Um, something unique and awesome, in my humble opinion. So uh, the whiter, lighter colored stones, that's usually a good sign. Um, some of the lighter colored stones you'll see are sandstones or siltstones, like this is a Norton uh, Queer Creek. This is a good mid, low range um, sharpening stone. You can still get them kind of cheap. They come from Ohio. You also want to be very careful assigning grit. A lot of people ask what kind of grit is that natural stone and um, I don't even bother. I just throw grit out the window when it comes to talking about, you know, how good a natural stone is. I prefer to say it's um, low mid-range, upper finisher and everything, you know, in between little caveats and characteristics because that's how they work. Um, Grit particle in the abrasive industry means one thing. There's all kinds of guidelines and standards. It's totally different from what geologists classify mineral structures and shapes in, you know. So there's that. To the heart of the subject, finding stones in the wild, um, you can never go wrong usually with a natural stone. The synthetics, eh. You know, unless they have a box or a label, you know, um, that adds collectability and uh, desirability to the equation always to a degree. But what are the food groups of natural stones? Like when you pick it up, you say, this looks natural. I don't think it's synthetic, but what is it? There's a handful of things it's going to be. You're going to have your uh, Novaculites, which are Arkansas's and Washita's. Novaculites also come from around the world. There are novaculites in um, Wales, uh, in the Mediterranean, and other places. And they're all pretty different than American novaculite, I'll tell you that. But generally, novaculite's very hard. It's an alpha quartz. It's a quartz, um, not silicone, it's a quartz carbide something. I gotta go back and review my, uh, you know, chemistry and geology. I'm not a geologist, I just like to imagine that I am sometimes. Novaculites, very good, very American. Stones are also really regional. You're going to find stones that are regional to you in your corner of the world. And then you'll find that they travel because people imported them. So Novaculites is kind of a major big whoop deal in American sharpening stone lore. Um, and they're very confusing, but we'll get to that and help you along with that. I have other content talking about that. This is just about identifying stones. Sand and siltstones are another one you find around the world. 
And um, they're going to include things like your Queer Creek. They're going to include stones like Hindustans, which come from Indiana. And um, they made a lot of gravestones. And this was it's a wet stone. These like a little water. Um, has these sedimentary layers. Common. And they're really nice. And they come in different finenesses that I found. But most of them are mid-range for tools, mid-upper range even. Some of the Hindustans have a lovely slurry. We'll get to characteristics in a moment. I'm getting ahead of myself. Nebaculites, check. Sand and siltstones, check. They're going to have that sandier, kind of uh, grayer to brownish look, usually. Check. Then you have your slates, which are going to be darker gray all the way up to black. Sometimes you find purple well slates. Um, sometimes there's slates that have a little green in them. Um, slates, by far and away, have given me, uh, challenged me the most to really evaluate and identify them. Um, many slates from around the world I have here, from America, from Europe, from Germany, and um, slate is usually really, really fucking nice. It's usually a nice finishing stone, and it can be a very nice finishing stone. But it's also kind of the most um, incognito stone. It looks humble, but unless you've used a lot of them and know them and know different points and color and characteristics you're looking at, um, they can be very tough to identify. But slates are always pretty, pretty, really good. We've covered the synthetics. Um, we're going to touch on the India stones because India stones are synthetics. The two most common stones you're going to find in every garage in America is going to be um, a silicone carbide, carborundum type stone. They're a blue gray at essence. When you lap them, they have a blue gray slurry. Next are your India stones. And India stones are going to have that maroonish red. And um, some of these have really fooled me over the, the years thinking they were naturals. Um, in particular, I will say some of the older antique India stones are of a quality and density that I find superior to the newer ones that I've seen. Since out of the way, um, what else is there? <coughs> well, there's one special exception to the rule of don't get combination stones in the wild. Two-toned, you know, um, similar tone, but you can obviously see a coarse and a fine. There is one type of natural sharpening stone that isn't a class of its own. It's totally unique, and it's the Belgian Codical. And they're going to have a yellow uh, tan. Sometimes you'll see um, little dark colors in them. And this comes out, believe you me, it's just stuck in here. But what we're going to show, I guess the air got dry and it closed up because this is a really tight fit box. It's probably teak. Let's show it like this then. See that two-tone? That's the Belgian blue whetstone natural back. So Belgian codicles are the only exception I'd say by it when you see that combination effect. They glued these onto um, Belgian blue whetstone historically. They occur naturally geologically, so you can find them like that, or they're glued on. So they can look like a common combination stone, but Belgian codicles are tit and exceptional and always worth good money. <coughs> okay. Moving along. By the way, at the very end, if you stayed with me this long, congratulations, you're a rock star. We're going to show off and talk about what I have. And we might even pull out a little trick for my hat, a magic trick that's uh, first time for a video. We're going to talk about the qualities of stones when sharpening because there's about five points. And this might intuitively make a lot of sense and it might be even be counterintuitive. But bear with me. Um, this is the crux of how to use these stones and start thinking about them in terms of their intrinsic qualities. Um, you can get any kind of sharpening stone, and it can be fast or slow, meaning in its action of removing metal from the tool you are sharpening. It can be slow, dull, 
totally irrespective of coarse or fine. Get that out of it. Just think stone can be fast or slow. That's one metric you can grade a stone on. Is it hard or soft? It's that scratchability test. Um, does it wear in? Or is it really, you know, um, durable? The one everyone wants to know, is it coarse, medium, or fine? That can be a spectrum. And these qualities can combine in every possible combination you could imagine. Stones will surprise you every day if you get into them. The other one is porosity or density. This is the heft in the hand, but here's the thing. I have some stones that are really dense, heavy, but they're very porous. Porosity is another function of, is it thirsty? Can you put water, will the stone soak up water? That's another good test you can do, but you need to degrease the stones to get the true, you know, thirstiness of the stone. But one way of talking about that is, is it light or porous? Or is it heavy or dense? And then we get into when you use it, you have the um, feedback, which is the actual noise or resistance or the tooth action, the glide. That's the feedback of what that stone tells you that you're feeling with your fingertips. And that is also going to relate to the slurry and what medium you're using. Water, oil, um, Windex, Simple Green, LA's Awesome Orange. I use all of it sometimes on the same stone you know back to back to back um, but that's another story for another day but the feedback that's a quality the slurry um, you can do some magic things with slurry particularly some of my favorite finishing stones um, have a lovely slurry quality where I use a little water the slurry from the stone kind of builds up it becomes a paste you can let it stop, let it dry out, or you can keep working that pace until it dries out, and you'll get a bump in your polishing, like a big bump off that one stone. So that's always interesting. Some of the finest finishing stones have that quality, and I have a stone that taught me that quality, and I have no idea if it's synthetic or natural to this day. I just know what it does, and um, someday I'll unlock it, and I'd buy a bench stone of it, or 20 of them if I could tomorrow. So something that 99% of you won't really care about is measuring a stone for specific gravity using the submersion, suspension method. How do you do that? three-point plan. Get a postal scale, switch it to grams. We're going to take this washita, which I suspect is going to be about 2.38 to 4 in specific gravity. But what we do is the grams. I call it the dry weight. This is 622 grams dry. So I call it grams dry. And here's the tricky part, but it's really easy once you get used to it. You tear out my scale. I recommend um, fishing line. This is the trickiest part that I still am struggling to get better at. But I wrap it just like tying a ribbon on a Christmas present. Okay, what you need to do is get a really good hold on this. And you're going to suspend it. And my scale is freaking out. The battery may be getting low. Let's just turn it off and see if we can boot this and get this done. So it'll tear itself out. Suspend, don't let it touch the bottom. We're going to go with 218 grams suspended. It's water displacement and weight. So what did I say? 218 grams suspended. Dry dead weight, weight suspended. 
It's just that easy. So I take the dry weight in grams, 622, divided by the suspended weight, 218. Wow, okay. Let me check that math one more time. 622 divided by 218. Wow, wow. Okay, we have a very fine, um, very dense. So I have a surgical black. I've had surgical blacks that just test out to the specific gravity of 2.67. This specific gravity of this stone is 2.85. And um, boy, it sure looks like Washita, but like the hardest kind. It's not translucent, it's not black, it's something else. Um, so that's interesting. It's very interesting. Only slates have higher, you know, specific gravities in that range, and that is not a slate. Most people will not care about specific gravity unless you're talking about an Arkansas, because specific gravity is only useful when you're measuring a known material. So for Novaculites, what you'll find is from the soft to the medium and hard Arkansas, they're going to range in density. I think the mineral structure inherent in the Novaculite is as hard as most of the others. It's just the density, the porosity. So this is very dense. That's interesting. So you will find that with different food group types of sharpening stones, the specific gravities and densities will fall in line, kind of like musical notes on the scales. Most of my slates range on the upper 2.7 to like, you know, 3 range. Um, most of the softer, uh, more grainier, we'll call them, sand and siltstones have specific gravities closer to 2.2. Um, I've measured over 100 stones in the last nine months, and I keep record of every stone that I've done. And I will tell you that the lightest stones I've seen, um, surely synthetic, can be as light as 1.7 specific gravity, and I have some stones that range up to specific gravity of 3.6, which is ridiculous to me. Um, specific gravity is correlated to density, which can indicate, you know, mineral content or, you know, uh, what kind of um, elements are in it. But, you know, stones have all kinds of stuff going on. So wow, we got through the thesis statement of how to evaluate stones in the wild. Congratulations, you get a gold star, you graduated. Let's have some fun and talk about some sharpening stones because I got some fun stuff on the bench. It's what you're all waiting for, right? Fresh in the mail, beautiful scotch hone. This is a tam o' shanter. Um, this is a kind of slate, but it's one of the best natural polishers I would recommend. These things are lovely and pretty pricey. <sighs> buddies, buddies. This double diamond hone, in some of the fine print, which I'll read to you, it says, selected from the very best product of Thuringian quarries. This is Thuringian stone. It probably had a rubbing stone originally. I don't know if you can read this, but that's a newspaper clipping from 1921. And this is, so righteously certainly a Thuringian. A little on the lighter color from the few I've had. Here's a bluer one. This one is a little greener. Just a touch of yellow, but I would not call it yellow green. Maybe it is though. I just, I haven't had eyeballs and my inspection equipment on a handful of Thuringians, not a lot. My sample size is about six. But this will be for sale soon. Um, this stone, surely a kind of slate, undressed, dressed to 60 grit, undressed, almost some green color, some hints of red rust oxide, you know, but the back is looking more like a, some kind of slate. 
This black stone, man, this thing is weird. Hintest, a faintest hint of maybe a label, some masking tape. Um, but I went to lap this, man. This, this thing is really weird. It's got these white specks, which you can see in there. And I swear to God, they like um, puff up like paper towel. I think this is synthetic. I've only seen one other type of stone <laughs> that had what looked like traces of like wood pulp fiber in it. And it was my Microtome Knife Hone, which is a highly specialized, highly killer polishing stone. Um, this, I tried out a little bit because I had to play it. It's slow, it's dull, it's weird. Um, it's weird. Nice old washita where I talked about this. Boy, this one is special. This one is very special. It's a nice little mahogany box. Yeah, a nice little, um, it's washita if you couldn't tell, but I haven't touched or cleaned it. I don't really plan to. Number one quality, pike. Cut from natural rock, world over for carpenters, woodworkers. Use thin, non-drying oil. Pike oil the best. Um, this has to come from, let's say the 1880s up to the 1920s, mid to late 1920s. So it's easily 100 years old. Um, and uh, I don't know, I might be keeping this one around for a while. We're not really sure. So that was a cool one. Um, WA, yeah, the man. Hope you get better soon. Um, gosh, this else something else we're gonna do. Oh yeah. Finally got two mobile phones. And one of the fun tricks I've had for a while, but I could never do both because I never had two phones was, we're gonna see if, yep. So this is that weird synthetic stone that is slow and dull, but kind of a polisher. And it's, it kind of looks like some stuff I've seen, but it's not. Let's look at a fresh washita face. The sandy, you know, just those little hints of butterscotch give it that maroon color. It could be old oil. Because what you'll see when you look, see that gray color? That's just metal swarf paste polish in the stone from it cutting. This white stone, which so looks like washita novaculite to me, but. It could be something close to like Flint or Chalcedony if it's not, um, you know, Washita from Indiana, Northern Arkansas. A little Tam O'Shanter. Been a while since I looked at one of these under scope. 